The votes are in. We asked who you wanted to hear from from the California Resource Investment Conference. The winner, David Morgan of The Silver Investor. Here's his full presentation from the show. Thank you. I've got a um, summation on video. I'm kind of famous actually for doing these videos and I've done several over the years. This is one that's uh, been put together recently by actually one of the people that is here at the show. So we're gonna go ahead and roll that and get you a little hyped up on the silver market. We'll start with that. Will silver be worth more than gold? Did you know there is actually less investable silver than there is gold? On average today, for every seven ounces of silver pulled out of the ground, only one ounce of gold is mined. However, the majority of silver mined is used for consumption, while the majority of gold mined is nearly all added to global inventory. Yet precious metal investors, as small of a group as they are, are still investing $7 in GLD for every $1 they invest in SLV. Looking at modern history, silver is becoming more and more scarce some even think it could be worth more than gold at some point in the future. In 1950, there were 10 billion ounces of above ground available silver. By 1980, it shrank to 3.5 billion ounces. And in 2010, it is estimated that above ground available silver supply is roughly 1 billion ounces. To put this into perspective, total above ground available gold in 1950 was 1 billion ounces and today it's estimated to be around 7 billion ounces. In 1980, when silver nearly reached $50 per ounce, global population was 4.5 billion people and global GDP was $10 trillion. China had the 11th largest economy. Today, global GDP is around 60 trillion and China is now the second largest economy with GDP around $5 trillion. 10 years ago, China exported 100 million ounces of silver per year. Now China is importing 100 million ounces of silver per year. So the population since 1980 is up 55%. Global GDP is up 500%. Above ground available gold is up 600%. Meanwhile, above ground available silver has plummeted at least 91%. And the price is still down 14% from its 1980 high of $50 per ounce. To say the opportunity in silver is enormous is an understatement. Looking at the historical silver to gold ratio of 15 to one, silver is highly undervalued. Today it takes 40 ounces of silver to purchase one ounce of gold. Even when ignoring the above ground supply deviation, mined metal production could at the very least bring that number to 10 to one. Silver, not gold, is being consumed more than ever and again, it is a fact that there is less above ground supply of silver than gold. Industrial demand for silver is up to 18% in just the last year. The need for silver is growing by the day. Silver is being used for bandages, for wound care, batteries, brazing, soldering, cell phones, computers, satellites, high-tech weaponry, lasers, digital technology, clothing, electronics, circuit boards, ink, solar cells, water purification, wood treatment, antennas, RFID chips, freeway toll transponders, passports, and the list goes on. From 1990 to 2000, nearly a billion ounces of above ground available silver disappeared to consumption. Yet industrial demand for silver was only up 35% by the year 2000. Today it's 54%. And looking at new uses for silver, the silver production deficit will only widen. China since 2003 has been growing its solar energy base by almost 100% every year. By 2014, the world will need 130 million ounces of silver just to satisfy one year of global solar demand. The world has consumed so much silver in the last 50 years that the last time above ground inventory was this low was 1300 AD. The deficit of silver production has been met from mostly above ground supplies. The US has dumped nearly 5 billion ounces since World War II into the silver markets. But as of 2010, according to the USGS, government stockpile for silver are listed as none. The supply and demand deficit continues to be ignored by global investors year after year, decade after decade. However, recently more and more people are learning the fundamentals for the silver market. 
Recently, major coin dealers in the U.S. have reported the demand in dollars for silver is now equal to the demand for gold. Total mining production for 2009 was 710 million ounces. Total demand was 889 million ounces. That is a mining production deficit of 179 million ounces. However, recycling is making up the difference currently. Could silver one day be worth more than gold? The demand for silver will continue to increase, yet mining production is only able to keep up for the next few years. After that, we could be depleting the above ground available silver supply, possibly by the end of this decade. Why? Even in the worst case scenario, silver demand will increase in these three main industrial areas, food processing and packaging, water purification, and energy. Just these three demands, which would remain even in a recession, are projected to exceed total silver production by the year 2017. This cannot be guaranteed, but the trend is clearly in place. Now, the other demand is for investment or monetary concerns. Do you think that individuals around the world are going to sell silver as the currency crisis accelerates? Are any of the major silver holding companies and ETFs finished buying silver? Is new demand developing due to the high price of gold and people understanding that silver has better fundamentals and is superior to gold? Silver, not gold, may be the greatest investment in human history. How often does any generation get the opportunity to invest in a finite resource that is becoming more valuable for both industry and wealth protection? Buy real. Get real. Be real. Any questions? <laughs> Not much left to say after that. All right, so this is uh, missing the silver market. It's a little bit of a rant on my part, but uh, one that comes up continuing on the internet is that silver's in a shortage. And not to be a semanticist, but the semantics of the word shortage and deficit are different. So I'm gonna go through this briefly. First of all, for review for everybody in the room, this is last year's production. Platinum is about 12 times rarer than gold, and silver is about eight times more plentiful than gold. So none of those ratios hold for what they're priced at. Platinum is actually selling for less than gold, even though it's about 11 or 12 times more scarce. And silver is about, right now, about 50th the price of gold, even though the ratio out of the earth is about eight to one but that's how they line up. And that's pretty much historically how they line up. There's some variances over time, but I'm gonna go into that right now. <clears throat> but a shortage doesn't equal a deficit. There have actually been shortages the way I define it. And a shortage to me is when you cannot meet the demand on the market or at the spot or when it's demanded. And there was a shortage in retail products in the bottom in 2008 during the financial crisis. Maybe some of the silver bears thought that a lot of people would cough up their silver at those low prices, but the opposite happened. People that were in the know wanted to buy silver at those extremely low prices. Although the spot price in the futures market was roughly $9, slightly under that at the bottom, the actual price to buy what I call retail product, which was government minted coins, one ounce silver rounds, which are privately minted coins, 100 ounce bars, 10 ounce bars, even one ounce bars, anything along those lines commanded a premium of about 20 to 30%. So you're paying about 1350 for silver when the paper price on the futures exchange was nine. Now, just to be perfectly clear, a commercial bar on a futures exchange could be purchased for $9 or less. I happen to do it. I bought three of them myself. In fact, I uh, took those and took, uh, sent them to a, a mint friend of mine it happens to be in this room, and I'm inviting him over to my booth after this lecture and minted them into uh, half-ounce silver rounds. So we have seen some shortages. Uh, also, when uh, Eric Sprott started the PSLV, the Physical Silver Trust, he purchased around 22 million ounces on the first tranche, and it took roughly two months to fulfill that order. Is that a shortage or not? You can make up your own mind on that. Will we see a shortage in the future? Yes, I believe it will happen. It'll happen, I think, and once it happens, it could develop into something very significant because industry 
need silver, as that little film clip showed you. Uh, that demand is very um, price inelastic. When you build a $5,000 refrigerator and the total content of silver is about 12 bucks, if the price of silver goes up tenfold and you have to pay 120 bucks for it for a $5,000 refrigerator, it's called price inelastic. They don't give a darn what the price of silver is, but you cannot manufacture that product without it. If that ever happens, and I'm forecasting that it would or could, I think it will, then you're going to see a rush from everybody that really doesn't warehouse much silver to get this just-in-time inventory because they'll have to close down their production line without it. Oops. The supply-demand curve looks like that. Remember, a shortage and a deficit are different things. The demand curve from 1990, I know this chart starts at 1992. In 1990, until about 2006, there was greater demand than there was supply for silver. And that deficit between those two lines was made up by above ground stockpiles. That little film pointed out, between 1990 and 2006, roughly 1.5 billion ounces of silver went into the marketplace to fill that gap. After 2006, we've actually been technically in a surplus. I tend to, to believe that's probably fairly accurate. And I get a little blowback on that because a lot of people that followed my work early on were concerned that if silver isn't in a deficit anymore, then what's the use of buying it? Because now, you know, it looks like we're at the margin and there's a little bit more out there that's available than, uh, you know, it's more supply than demand currently. And I said, you know, if that's what you think, that's fine. But apply that same logic to the gold market. So we look at it in raw numbers, everyone can understand. What I'm saying is, you've got a roughly a six-month supply of silver above ground, but in the same context, you have a 40-year supply of gold above ground. Gold is a monetary metal, and that's the reason you can have a 40-year supply above ground and continue to see the increase in price, and I think everyone in this room knows all the arguments about that, and it just boils down to the financial situation globally. Silver has every attribute of money that gold has, and because of that, and it's, less, it's more affordable, I think you're going to see more and more demand on the silver side than the gold side going forward, only because there's a lot more poor people that want to protect their wealth as there are people that are able to afford gold, gold once it gets above 2,000 or so. Pick a number. But the idea, I think, is very clear. Photography is killing the silver market. It's true that uh, digital photography took the silver market uh, substantially down. The amount of silver halide processing now is roughly uh, significantly less than it was in 1999. Digital has come to the fore. Almost everybody here has a phone that has a camera on it. It's all digital. It's great. Remember when that myth was started? Silver was at about $4.80 an ounce. It's been as high as 48. It's about a 10 bagger. So how did that myth work out for you? you know? Anyone that didn't buy silver because of the photography lie didn't understand what was going on. I had to go through great detail about the photography myth in my book. I'm not going to lecture for an hour on the myth, but the basics of it is all that silver was recycled. People had the idea that photography used silver up like it does in most other applications. In photography, it was all recycled. So it's a zero-sum game. If you used a million ounces in silver halide film, you got a million ounces out or 100 million ounces out the next year and on and on it went. So it was a zero-sum game, but most people didn't understand that. Again, I went through it in my book in rather good detail. This is a chart that shows pretty significantly what happened. Uh, you can see the photography, silver halide processing, down significantly. I never argued that point. I said, yes, it would, but it didn't mean anything. Again, the price went up tenfold while this photography myth was pervasive throughout a lot of people didn't really understand the silver market. On the other hand, the electronic side has come up, and of course, that helped the market, and that's why we've got higher prices along with investment demand. At high prices, silver will be recycled. Now, I want to be very clear here because over and over again, especially in the silver community, you hear that there's less silver available than gold or something that's a little bit vague like that. And I want to be very specific here. The amount of above ground silver that's in investment form is less than gold in investment form. The amount of above ground silver that exists in all forms is probably 20 billion ounces, okay? So let's be crystal clear on that. However, the amount in investment form, which is either commercial bar form, which is your 1,000 ounce commercial bars, and your coin form, which is silver rounds, government-minted uh, 
coins like the Silver Eagle or the Silver Maple or any of those. And even old coins like what's referred to as uh, junk silver in the trade or constitutional coinage, anything like that. All of that combined is roughly a billion. And all the commercial bars combined is roughly a billion. So even though the film said a billion ounces total, they're referring to the commercial side only. If you combine those two, you got about two billion ounces of investment grade silver available. Gold probably in that same form, in that same context, stab at it probably four billion ounces. So just to be clear, now that's why I gave you that background to move on to this next case. At high prices, silver will be recycled. So in other words, the silverware, the silver art objects, all the silver plate, the silver jewelry, all that stuff that's, that is out there, and I admit is out there, will be recycled. I'm not so sure that it will be. And the reason I say that is there was a study done in 1992 by Charles Rivers Associates, and they went through that very same point. And what they determined was that during what I call the 1980s meltdown, that most of that silver came back into the market between 1980 and 1985. And a lot of the silverware, silver jewelry, art objects, et cetera, went into the market, flowed through, and became commercial bars after they were re-smelted. I'm not saying that none of it exists out there. Sure, there's plenty of it. But the study determined that it would have to take extremely high prices. Let's face it, <clears throat> people usually want to get what they pay for something. The markup on jewelry, especially silver, is extremely high. Same thing with silverware. And most people that are in those categories don't need the money, usually. The point being, and I believe this to be true, but it cannot be proven, and the market will prove me correct or wrong, not much scrap, there's not as much scrap as many people think, and most of it's in artwork and religious items, and most of those are not coming back in the market. Artwork is just too high a value for the, the scrap value. Uh, let's use a couple quick examples. Both my daughters play flute. They both have what? Sterling silver flutes. What, what a surprise, right? I mean, those flutes are like in the $800 to $1,200 range, okay? You think I'm gonna smelt them down for you know 12 bucks worth of silver? Are you kidding me? Well, anyone here in the equine world? Anyone know what equine is? The horse world? I'm on the English side, but the Western side, there's lots of saddles that have like silver all over. You see them in the parade sometimes. Some of you guys do, do know this stuff, I'm sure. You think a saddle that they spent you know, 8,000 bucks for that's got maybe 400 bucks worth of silver is gonna be pawned for 400 bucks? So you gotta use your head about this stuff. I'm just giving a couple of examples. I'm just suggesting to think these things through. You don't have to agree with me, but at least think about them. All right, high prices, will solar be recycled? The answer is yes, it probably will be. It's silver's high enough, but the demand for solar is extreme. It's growing just as projected by Jessica Cross out of uh, London a few years ago. I took her work and gave her credit, but she's the one that said she thinks that we'll see 130 million ounces per year used in solar demand starting about 2014. So far, she's pretty much on track. Silver's price is driven by industrial demand. Certainly it is somewhat. It does make up over 50% of the market, but it's actually the monetary demand that's, that's continuing to push the silver prices higher. It's always the margin that moves a market. It's the last buyer that sets the price. And the last buyer in silver is the monetary or investment demand. You gotta remember that this is a different market. It's a different globe, it's a different context. What took silver high in 1980 is really a different structural basis than what's taken it higher this time. The problem in the United States with inflation were so minuscule compared to the problems on a global basis now that it's almost laughable thinking back, and I lived through the first bull market uh, compared to what I think we're facing in the future. Consider the fact that there was only a U.S. market when the price went to $50 an ounce on an intraday basis. And now we have the Chinese, we have all of Asia, we have the Russians, we have the Europeans much more awake than they were last time. There's less silver available than 1980, probably by a factor of 50%, I'll be conservative there, so it's probably half as much investable silver as there was in 1980, right now. The monetary base is 600%, let me explain that before I get in an argument with anybody. I'm talking about M1, I'm talking about checkbook money and pure cash. I'm not talking about credit which I don't consider to be money. I consider credit as credit and cash as cash. The internet is connecting people with the truth in quotation marks. I think a lot of people are waking up 
and finding out what's really going on in the financial system and why it's not working. And it is a poor man's gold. And I always ask you to consider the fact that there's probably a lot more quote unquote poor people than there are rich people. And those people, in my view, and having experience of the last bull market, will gravitate to silver because one is more affordable. You don't have to believe what I believe, but I believe that most people have a financial instinct, just like a survival instinct, that as things start to unwind further in the financial system, they will naturally seek some type of wealth protection. And silver fits that bill pretty well. It has in history past. One of my pets is silver is not money. And you'll get this. I have some of my um, colleagues at the, that stand on these same platforms. And they're certainly entitled to their opinion. And some of them have said, plain and simple, that silver is an industrial metal, it's not money. I'd like to take you back to Milton Freeman in uh, 1993. He spoke at the Blanchard Conference that at the time was considered to be the foremost authority as far as these type of conferences are concerned. He was the keynote speaker and he said the major monetary metal in history is silver, not gold. He is a Nobel laureate in uh, economics. I agree with some of his, uh, some of his stances, not all of them, but um, he was a better economist than most. I'd like you to take a look at that picture coming out of a junk bag, as it's called, and tell me what is that? Is that 5,000 grains of Arabian sand? I mean, really, is it money or isn't it money? I mean, I think, I think it's pretty clear, especially if you go back to the 1792 Coinage Act with the Constitution and look at what money is defined as. A dollar is a weight of silver, right? 371.25 grains of fine silver is what a dollar is defined as, you know? So it's money. I mean, I, I just, I won't back down on that argument. The silver species standard, which means silver coin standard, was widespread from the fall of the Byzantine Empire until the 19th century. It lasted longer than the gold standard. In 52 countries, the word for money is silver. In other words, the, money, the word money and silver are synonymous. How many are on my mailing list? Just put up your hand. Did some of you got my latest email about a week ago or so. It talked about watch this little video called uh, the empty ATM. Put up your hands if you, if you watch that. If you were paying really close attention to that during that whole half hour or whatever it is, the gentleman out in uh, Argentina was saying plata, and that's silver. But he's speaking about money. He said he wanted his money out of the ATM. Plata. Plata is silver. So for me to just go to the Latin-based languages and say that you know, silver is not it's not money, I'd be saying, well, money isn't money, or silver isn't silver. They wouldn't understand what I was talking about. The Chinese character for money is a building with silver bars, not gold. The Torah, all, anyone Jewish in here? I'm sure there are. So anyway, the point is that they use silver as money in the Torah. It's not gold, it's silver. It's only in North America where we have about 6% of the world's population that brainwashed into thinking that only gold is money. The rest of the world doesn't agree with you, so I'm on the other side. Price and price expectations. This is always important. Everyone wants to know how high the price is going to go. But before we actually visit that, I'd like to try and get everyone to do a paradigm shift in their thinking. And the reason being is that everyone focuses, in my view, on the wrong thing. And the reason that we all do that, and I'll include myself in that, is because we're taught to estimate our determine our financial worth in terms of dollars. And a dollar is a floating, vague concept because they change. I mean, if you have an ounce of silver, does it ever change? The mass of a silver coin or a gold coin is always and everywhere the same throughout the universe. It never changes. And really, people seek consistency. They seek something tangible and something constant in their lives. The only thing that we can be guaranteed in life is change. Things change, and they're changing more rapidly than ever. But a coin, the coin standard, is stability. So really, when I say the price and price expectations, what I want you to focus on is what an ounce of gold or what an ounce of silver buys, not how many paper dollars it's worth. Everyone in this room, unless you're brand new, knows that the historic 
worn out mantra about gold is an ounce of gold will buy a men's suit, a fine men's suit, and it's always been that way. Well, it hasn't always been that way. The price of gold, at some points in history, buys a lot more than it normally does, and sometimes buys a lot less than it normally does. That's the norm. So if you have an ounce of gold and it buys a hundred men's suits, do you think it's overvalued or undervalued? Well, everyone in this room knows the answer. It's overvalued. So consider that when you're trying to find a point for you personally that makes sense to exit the market, but not necessarily in the terms of dollars. So having said that, I'm going to go ahead and give you a price in dollars just to, um, not to contradict myself, but just to give you an idea. So the idea here is this chart, which is in constant $19.98. This was pr produced by Forbes magazine. I don't expect anyone to be able to read any of that stuff in the back of the room, but I can explain it because it's a pretty simple chart. Remember, these are constant dollars, so we've taken the inflation lie out of this chart. So what I'm showing you here is that the all-time high price through about the 13th century was $1,477 an ounce for silver. Now, that's a fact. That can't be changed. That's history. It's, it's past tense. It's done. So when I suggest that silver will get to at least $100 an ounce U.S., put it into the perspective of all-time recorded monetary history that I'm saying it's going to get to about 1 15th of the all-time high. So within that context, I think I'm being fairly conservative. If you drop down into this level here, that's about $200 an ounce for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years, dropped down around 70 an ounce. And it wasn't until silver was really demonetized that you got these big blips. And Buffett bought right there. And what type of an investor is Warren Buffett? A value investor. He bought it under the cost of production. You could not dig silver out of the ground, mint it, put it into bar form for $4.20 an ounce. Cannot be done. But you could buy it for that. And he did. He bought 129.7 million ounces of fine silver right at the bottom. <clears throat> Price expectations. This is a chart of palladium. I use it as a proxy for what I expect in the silver market. And I think it does a pretty good job for us. What you find in palladium is that you had years and years and years of just basically trending sideways. Yes, it went up and down and went up and it went down. But basically, the wear you out or scare you out or who cares mode. Silver was basically in that mode for 20 years. And then finally, it breaks free, gets above that high, and it makes a rally. And everyone gets excited, and you get a lot of buying at the top because humans say they buy low and sell high, but they don't. They buy high and want it to go higher. So there's people that got in here and bought, and it fell back here. And it took a good year and a half before it got back here. So if I'm going to equate that chart to silver, it went from 555 on the breakout to 840 at the top. And then it took some time, it touched back down, and it took some time before it got above that price and went higher. So as markets work, there's somebody that bought it at 840, and they got over leveraged, and they lost their position, or it came back down, and their wife said, sell it, and they sold it, and it took a year and a half. So in this whole time frame, they're looking pretty smart. You know, maybe they sold it at 840. And then it gets there, and it's got back, and everyone's out there that's in the charting biz industry says it's a double top. And it goes from a double top all the way up to here, right? Gets up to 48. A lot of my friends are calling me up and saying, David, do not call a top. You're not bullish enough. You're going to be wrong. You're going to look bad. I'm all ready for this because I know at the top, when it's really the top, I will be getting a lot more of that. I said, well, you're entitled to your opinion. I'm selling my trading position at 48. And then it comes back down and it goes to 33. And it takes a lot more time and it finally gets up there. Palladium actually went up slightly higher and came back down. And then you get the blow off rally. And that's what I expect in silver. I expect it to be in the world history books, actually, for what's going to take place in silver and gold. I think platinum palladium will probably have quite a ride as well. But uh, we are facing uncharted waters in the economic sphere, 
And I think this is something that you need to study and be familiar with and make your own decisions because we are facing, I think, the most interesting financial times ever. If you come and buy my newsletter, we have those on the table, you'll get one. I also will pay you to buy my newsletter. I have 20 of these. These are one half ounce minted coins that I told you about earlier that I had minted from me from a friend of mine here in this room that has uh, the logo for Silver Investor on the back. And it's worth today's price probably $16, no, $17, $18. So I'll give you that if you sign up for the newsletter. But I only have 20 of them, so there's the first 20 people. So I'll give you the 10-year study that I did, and I'll give you one of these coins. And that is my pitch for today. Thank you very much for your time. We hope you enjoyed this special presentation. Reporting from Palm Springs, I'm Daniela Cambone for Kitco News.